After all this big government meddling in gasoline and debt, it all means one thing, that gas costs more than it should and that our children are going to pay for the drug addict-like spending addiction of politicians today. But here now, a Tea Party-endorsed senator committed to getting the government out of the oil market, Kentucky Senator Rand Paul. He's also the author of a fascinating new book, The Tea Party Goes to Washington. Senator Paul, welcome here. Good to be with you. All right, so uh, I want to talk about oil. I want to talk about the book. I want to talk about the debt. And your colleague, Senator Mike Lee, will be joining us uh, in a couple of moments. Uh, the federal government charges 18 cents a gallon in tax at the pump. It has nothing to do with getting the oil to you. Should we be paying that? Should the government reduce that tax in times when oil is spiking 33 cents in two weeks? Well, the interesting thing is most of the push I hear are people all wanting to raise that tax. Right. So we're lucky if we can keep the tax where it is probably. But really what we need to do is have a government that is friendly to business. We all need electricity. We all need gasoline for our cars. But we have a government right now that I think is the most anti-business government or administration that we've had in my lifetime. And yet the president appoints somebody like uh, uh, Bill Daley, the, uh, the brother of the soon-to-be ex-governor of Chicago and a former senior vice president at uh, J.P. Morgan Chase in order to put on the front of being in favor of business. The president went along with keeping the Bush era tax rates where they were in the uh, lame duck era of Congress, claiming that he's in favor uh, of business. His words don't always match up what he's doing. Well, and he claims he wants to do something about regulations, but then they have this sort of nebulous code they're going to use and say that we'll get rid of regulations as long as they don't affect human dignity. Well, a lot of us are wondering how you are going to measure human dignity in relation to trillion dollar regulations. I think it's impossible. You know, um, a federal judge in New Orleans, Judge Martin Feldman, uh, ordered the government to process permits for drilling. Remember, there were 31 oil wells right. there. Only one of them blew. It was catastrophic. People died and the loss was into the tens of uh, billions. But there was nothing wrong with the other 30. The federal government expected, inspected the other 30 and said, well, okay, they're doing what they're supposed to be doing, but we're not going to let you drill. Judge Feldman ordered them to drill, let the, allowed them to drill. They didn't. Judge Feldman held officials in the Interior Department in contempt, and they let one drill, and now they're appealing that decision on the one. We, Are they crazy? Well, we prevent them from drilling, and then then we increase and have to pay their unemployment benefits. And it's a, it is a crazy system. We worry about being energy independent. We worry about having to send troops over to the Middle East to guard the oil and to take care of the oil production over there. But we don't drill for oil in our country. Our electricity comes primarily from coal. Half of our electricity comes from burning coal. In Kentucky, it's 90 percent wow. comes from burning coal. And yet they won't give any permits. We have permits that have been sitting there for seven years. What should we do with the enormous oil reserve that the government has in caves or some type of containers under Louisiana? Should we tap it now? Does the government belong in the business of owning this much oil? We need to get the government out of the business because, you know, the way you distribute goods and why goods are distributed efficiently in the marketplace is because they have a price and someone makes a profit. If you don't make a profit, you get booted out of that business. The government never has to make a profit, so the government's not very efficient right. at distributing goods. And so we need to, it always is, you know, and I hear you say it in your monologue, government is best that governs least. The reason we want government to be small is because they don't work for a profit and they aren't very efficient. Here's somebody that agrees with you, your uh, colleague, Utah Senator Mike Lee. Go uh, Senator Lee spearheaded a balanced budget amendment to the Constitution in the Senate, which almost made it, Senator Lee. I got to tell you, as I've told you earlier, even though I'm sitting with someone who voted with you, I was shocked and, and, and surprised, pleasantly so, that you almost got that through. Is there another, another chance at this one, an amendment to require the government only to spend what it takes in? Absolutely. We're going to keep pushing this issue until it succeeds. Uh, we got 11 Democrats to vote with us, and next time it's going to be more. Because everyone knows that the American people are overwhelmingly behind the idea of a balanced budget amendment, and that's what we need right now. Congress isn't going to fix this problem until it's legally required to. And the people expect for members of Congress to impose this legal obligation on themselves. Now that we won't have a balanced budget amendment, uh, because there weren't enough votes in the, in the Senate to stop a filibuster, a modern-day filibuster. There was no Jimmy Stewart goes to Washington moment by one vote. Will you, Senator Paul, and I have a reason to believe Senator Lee will do this, will you vote against raising the debt ceiling? 
Uh, yeah, I can't imagine why I would vote to raise the debt ceiling. I've told people that I would under one instance, and that is that we pass a balanced budget amendment to the Constitution and that we show significant budgetary reform, significant budget cuts, maybe a five-year plan to balance the budget, and a balanced budget amendment. Unfortunately, I don't see those things come. But the one thing is, is Mike Lee is going to bring his balanced budget amendment up again. It will be voted on again, right. hopefully before the debt ceiling. Senator Lee, uh, your colleague, Senator Paul, who's in the studio with me, has proposed a $500 billion uh, cut or reduction in the president's budget for 2012. His father told me that even that's not enough, that we need $500 billion a year for three or four years, or we need $1.6 trillion, so that effectively we have a balanced budget, so that effectively the president doesn't spend more than he takes in. What are the chances of that happening? Well, right now the chances are not good. Congress continues to kick this can down the road just because it can, even though every time we kick it, it gets more painful, and next time it may well kill us. We're taking in uh, about $1.7 trillion a year in new debt. What this translates into uh, are thousands and thousands of dollars per person every single year that the government's borrowing against us. We can't do that. It's costing us jobs. It's costing our economy. Uh, uh, the ability to heal itself. And w we can't move forward until we get a balanced budget amendment in place. Can you, Senator Lee, prevent the Senate from voting in favor of raising the debt ceiling? That is, can you filibuster it? Uh, do they have 60 or 61, whatever it now takes uh, to break that filibuster? Or is there a chance that the president, this president, in the next few months might actually have to live within Econ 101 where he doesn't spend more than he takes in? I, I certainly hope that we are within a few months of where this president and this administration, this Congress, might have to live within the amount of money that's uh, being brought into the federal government every year. Uh, to answer your, your, the first part of your question, I'm not sure what the outcome is going to be. But what I am sure about is what my vote is going to be. I will resist any effort to raise the national debt ceiling, and that will include utilizing the filibuster rules. All right. Earlier today, uh, the president suggested that NATO forces may consider military action in Libya. NATO forces would, of course, include the United States of America. Presumably, we're an integral part uh, of NATO. Do we have any business doing that? I think America should be reluctant to go to war. It always should be a last resort. It should be fully discussed in the Senate and in the House. We should talk about our national interests threatened. We should also talk about the practical aspect of are we ready to be in three wars simultaneously. And uh, I'm very reluctant to vote to send my kids to war or your kids to war or me to war unless our national security is truly threatened. Senator Lee, it's interesting that uh, Senator Paul said he's reluctant to vote. Y you know. Uh, as well as I, that under a terrible law called the War Powers Act, the president can commit us to a land war or an air war, whatever he wants to do, for 90 days and then renew it for another 90 days, and there's nothing the Congress can do about it. Is he planning to do something like that, whether the American people, whether the Congress wants it or not, even though the Constitution says only Congress shall declare war? Well, I, I certainly hope not. Um, uh, look, every time Congress does something it's not supposed to do, we have a problem. In some ways, we have an even greater problem when Congress fails to do something that it is supposed to do. When we go to war, there ought to be a declaration of war, and we ought to set out what the military objectives are so that we know what we're getting into and why we're getting into it, and we know when the conditions have been fulfilled so that we can bring our brave young men and women home. Earlier uh, today, the president signed an executive order calling for indefinite detention of people at Guantanamo Bay. Stated differently, even if they're tried and found not guilty, he wants to hold them there for as long as he wants to hold them there. Something that he spoke out against when he was Senator Obama. Uh, Would the Senate be willing to go along with that? The interesting thing is I spoke to a mother the other day of somebody who lost someone at 9-11 in one of the Twin Towers attacks. And she said to me she wants justice. And so the thing is, is justice should be a trial and, and do something with the people who are responsible for this. So indefinite inten uh, detention I don't think is a good idea. Let's go ahead and have trials and let's have justice. Last question, Senator Lee. I know in your, in your youth you clerked for a justice of the Supreme Court of the United States. Do you think the Supreme Court would ever go for something that no Western government has ever claimed? The power to detain, to incarcerate after acquittal, after a jury? finds them not guilty, they still go back to jail? What's the sense of having a trial? Yeah, it certainly seems very unlikely given tea leaves that we've been given by the Supreme Court in the last few years. And particularly in light of the scenario that you painted just a minute ago and your question to Senator Paul, uh, where you have someone who's been tried and found not guilty, 
uh, ongoing detention after that seems especially problematic. Senator Mike Lee from Utah, Senator Rand Paul from Kentucky. It's, oh, before we forget, Senator Paul's new book, here it is. The Tea Party Goes to Washington. Uh, your favorite fill-in for Glenn Beck is quoted in here, and it's a great book, not okay. just because you quoted me, but because it describes so wonderfully uh, the agenda of the small government folks in a big government town. Good luck with the book, and thanks for joining us. Thank you. And Senator Lee, thanks uh, for joining us as well.